skepticism. What's the point? For a minute there, I was on a crusade, arrested by the spirit of Dawkins. I might as well have had, look, mum, I'm an atheist emblazoned on my t-shirt. I had this voice in the back of my mind going, irrationality is a scourge on this planet and I will stamp it out wherever I find it. Even if I have to travel to the four corners of the earth until I am one day rightfully crowned most skeptical ever, I will not rest until religion and spirituality are vanquished from the feeble minds of believers in Bronze Age superstition. But like, why? Irrationality is as much a part of human nature as rationality is. Wherever you find one, the other is usually not that far behind. Religion, politics, atheism, it doesn't matter where you look, one follows the other in pretty swift motion. And I've spoken before on the channel about how, for me, spiritual trauma meant that skepticism became like a way for me to wall myself off from spirituality. And that doesn't mean I necessarily disagree with the stuff I've been saying on the channel over the last couple of years or so. It just means that I, I think there's something missing from it and I think there's, there was something motivating me that I wasn't necessarily always aware of. To which end, skepticism, as I was applying it, and we'll get back to that in a minute, became like a safe place for me to never have to worry about spirituality for myself or the potential truth necessarily in any of these things again. And if you've ever been through anything similar to me and you know, spirituality going very badly, ending up in a cult or anything like that, then you can probably understand that urge to like put as much distance between yourself and spirituality or anything close to the thing that hurt you as possible, just so you don't ever have to go anywhere close to that again. And that is something that I have talked about in the spiritual trauma video, so I won't bother going over it again, but the card's up there if you wanna check that out. Let me just take a quick second to say, if you're enjoying this video today and you wanna hear a little bit more from me on the kind of topics that I share on the channel, there's always stuff that doesn't like lend itself to like a full video, but usually it's best expressed in a paragraph or two, so I've been putting those up on my Instagram. So if you're interested in a little bit more from me in your social media, make sure you definitely follow me on Instagram. Anyway, back on with the video. So a little over a year ago I asked my wife to do a street epistemology on me so if you're not familiar with what street epistemology is it's, it's akin to the Socratic method um, there's a lot of questions and essentially the idea is to figure out how you know what you know what your relationship to your knowledge of a certain thing is basically you know if you if you really drill down into why you think that's true and how you think you know that thing's true right so I got my wife to use that kind of line of questioning on me to see if we could figure out anything that I would accept as proof of God. For a long time, I was like, I don't believe in God, but you know, if there was, if proof was presented to me, I would accept that proof. So I wanted to like, well, what proof would I accept? Throughout this conversation, it, it was shown that I couldn't imagine anything. There, there was no version of, of, of an experience or evidence that could be provided to me of the existence of a God that I would accept. And I ended up basically saying at the end of this conversation that you know, even if I was presented with an experience or some sort of evidence of God that was relying on the mediation of my senses, I wouldn't accept it because, you know, my senses could be faulty, it could just be a hallucination or something like that. To be fair, there's some merit to that argument, but not trusting your own senses is a little bit of a slippery slope and it, and it also brushes up against this issue of like, how militant do you want to be with the these ideas, especially when ultimately in many cases what's at stake is purely your quality of life and, and we'll, we'll circle back round to that one. In the end, the awkward position I found myself in was that I was saying I was open-minded and saying I was open to being, you know, to, to a proof of some kind of God and yet any idea of evidence, any experience that could be presented to me as an evidence of God, I wasn't willing to accept. So I'm not about to say I've just converted to Christianity or you know, I believe in God or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this experience hung in my mind as a reminder to be open-minded. Because for a long time for me, even after that, in a way that I hadn't really realized until recently, skepticism became a way for me to disregard ideas. Now, if you've applied skepticism at any point in your life ever, you will know a common outcome of skepticism is the disregarding of ideas. But that I don't think should be your intended outcome for using skepticism. The point of skepticism is not to disregard ideas. It is to sort through ideas for truth and for usefulness. That's what I think. I just don't think that skepticism is just a tool for just disregarding things. That's, what's the point then? I think if that is how skepticism is being applied, that is probably better described as cynicism 
or being a smart ass, <laughs> being a know-it-all. I don't think that's exactly skepticism. I was talking to a friend about this recently and they described cynicism as skepticism applied with a closed mind. And I think that is a brilliant description of it. And so I think the mistake that I've made more than a few times with spiritual ideas is treating these ideas that I have disregarded as being untrue for one reason or another as if they have no value. More specifically, I'm talking about the benefit of believing in something deemed untrue to be negligible at best. Just sort of being able to explain this away and then saying, well, because it's not true, the benefits should be overlooked or, or, or disregarded just on account of it being untrue, you know. If this is getting a little bit out there for you, stick with me because there's a logic to this, okay? And I think emphasizing the perceived or potential risks of believing in a potentially untrue thing meant that I was understating the potential benefit of believing in that thing. From a cynical point of view, that's, that's easily done. But my approach to the usefulness and the truth of certain things changed when I saw the impact of both atheism and cynicism really and spirituality on my wife and so this is an interesting point because oftentimes when I've talked about what I'm talking about here like the the potential benefit of believing in potentially untrue things people tend to assume that I'm making a case for believing something that I want to believe and it's coming from a desire to believe it first and foremost but that's not actually the case uh, this idea maybe latterly has become a framework for me to begin to entertain some spiritual ideas again but it didn't start that way this actually for me came from seeing people i care about being affected by these different belief structures and recognizing that maybe there's more to this than I thought there was. So when I crowned into my atheist edgelord phase and went like full on Dawkins, my confidence in my newfound atheism shook my wife's confidence in her spirituality. And that was a spirituality that until then was kind of working quite well for her. There was no need for that to be interrupted in the way that it was. It was working fine she was doing all right. After her confidence in her spirituality was sort of shaken, she began to develop some quite serious depression and anxiety, death anxiety at the uh, at the heart of it all really. And after a while, it, it became clear that this atheism and this skepticism, which was probably at its heart more a cynicism, how much that had affected my wife. It was like there was something missing from her life without that. And so when she kind of came back to it, I, I saw how much these things meant to her. I saw, how much better off she was believing in these things and having these practices and stuff. And yeah, you know, I, I was resistant to it at first because from my point of view, you know, irrationality was a scourge of the earth and we needed to cleanse these things because there was no reason to blah, 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 you know, that whole Dawkins spiel, right? And that had a lasting impact, I think, on both of us. But when I saw how much better off she was believing in these things, compassion kind of took over and I was like, okay, like, let's just set my ideas to the side and recognize what's happening here, you know? And I and I did see considerable improvements in her mental health, in its overall well-being when she brought spirituality back into her life. And it was then that I had to admit that even if I didn't share those beliefs, even if I thought what she believed was untrue, believing in it still benefited her. Now, if you're a skeptic, you're probably thinking placebo, right? And do you know what? Maybe. But here's the thing. In a double-blind study where one group is given a placebo and the other is given actual medicine, the people that recover as a consequence of the placebo still recover. They still do better because of taking that placebo. For that individual who has now benefited from taking that placebo, that's not insignificant. They're still better off because of that. And then there's the issue of open label placebos. So as far as I know, there is some evidence to suggest that even if you know what you're about to do or take or whatever is a placebo, you may still benefit from taking that thing. It follows then that there may be some benefit in believing potentially untrue things, as absurd as that sounds. And this, if nothing else, is a case for tolerance but it may also be a case for something else. It may also be a case for a truly open-minded skepticism. In this context, then skepticism evaluates the truth of a thing and then whether or not it is deemed to be true, 
proceeds to evaluate the usefulness of a thing. If a thing is deemed untrue, but useful, there may be a case for embracing a little bit of playfulness in taking that idea and behaving as if you do believe it, even if you don't, even if you believe it's untrue, so that you may experience some benefit that a person who believes in it might experience. And, and I realize that's pretty out there in what I'm saying now. I realize that's kind of a strange thing to say, but I hope that you've been able to come along with me to this point. And of course, certain precautions do need to be taken to make sure that you're safe in doing this kind of thing and you know that you're not gonna get caught up with cult leaders or grifters and things like that. But I do feel like over the last couple of years, I've made my case on that being an important thing already. I don't feel like I need to repeat myself here on that now. So if you haven't heard me talk about that so far, playlists upon playlists on that on this channel. So please check those out as well. Here in this video, we return to skepticism. What's the point? For me, it used to be part of a crusade to rid the world of irrationality, a futile quest if ever there was one. These days, how I apply skepticism in my life, and this may be different for you, and feel free to apply your skepticism differently to how I apply mine, right? But for me, in my life, how I apply skepticism now, it's first, first and foremost, it is a tool to ensure my safety and my well-being. And secondly, it is a tool to provide me with opportunities to be safely and absurdly irrational. Whenever I make videos like this, there's always stuff that doesn't make it into the video, be it due to like time constraints or because YouTube doesn't like you talking about certain things on the platform. So one of the things I've started doing over on my Patreon is I've started creating these little audio companion things that go along with each week's video. So if you want to hear a little bit more from me on this week's video and previous week's videos, then check out the Patreon link in the description, see which tiers right for you. I'm Andy Fellows, and if you're a former New Ager like me and you're interested in a more grounded and skeptical approach to New Age spirituality, then why not subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. Otherwise, please be kind and ask good questions and I'll see you in the next one.